for our presence here today, as we do always, and we pray to him and we trust that he will guide us so that we do not err. <clears throat> it is a beautiful day here, just turned cool, but it's a beautiful day. Beautiful day in, in the Chicago area. I was in somewhat in the south just yesterday, and uh, it was so cold, I said, boy, oh boy, this is winter. What's, what am I to expect when I go back home? <laughs> and got back home, it was a little better than it was south of us. So the weather, the weather is not predictable anymore like it used to be. The weather pattern, that is. The weather pattern has changed, is changing. Basically the same, but you can experience a summer day sometimes in December here in Chicago, in Chicago area. In December, 60 degrees or more. Uh, we've experienced that. In fact, some, <clears throat> some individual on t TV were, were uh, swimming <laughs> in December <laughs> one year here in, the, here in this area. And uh, I don't know, there's a lot of mysteries in life and we'll never know all of them. We'll never be able to understand it all. But it's, to me, as the more I study, I'm a student of the natural environment more than I am a student of anything else. And the uh, more I study the natural environment, the more I'm convinced that the natural environment seems to always reflect what's happening in the people or with the lives of the people on Earth. And we always seem to reflect what's happening in the natural environment. Yes. So you see how unpredictable the patterns are for weather now. And uh, the people are the same. Very unpredictable. What was expected uh, years ago cannot be expected today. The things that we could study in the behavior of people, or the happenings that we could study in the behavior of people, could enable us to predict what, the, what the, is going to happen tomorrow, next week, down the road, you know, maybe for months, maybe for even for years, but no more. The people are just as unpredictable in their patterns, behavioral patterns, as uh, the weather is, and the weather is seem to be reflecting us and we seem to be reflecting the weather. The natural world reflecting us and we seem to be reflecting the natural, the natural world. <clears throat> Our theme has been and it continues to be researching our religion and establishing business for our neighborhoods, contributing and supporting the business life, business life of our neighborhoods. Um, you know, if you study every other people in these United States, you'll find none of them as weak financially as we are in the establishment of our neighborhoods. They will have more property in their neighborhoods, accredited to them, their name, whether they be Irish, Polish, Spanish, or Mexicans, or whatever, they'll have more to their credit, to their name, to the credit of their name, in their neighborhood than we have. When we travel through our neighborhoods, we can't see ourselves in the material establishment of our neighborhoods. We don't see ourselves. Our name is not on it. Others, the name of others, is on it. That should bother us. That did bother us. That bothered African American leaders in the past, before the Honorable Elijah, even before the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But when he came on the scene, he made that a number one issue. That we have to stop depending on other people to do for us what we were created to do for ourselves. And we still have that burden 
And just as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and those African-American leaders, Christians, and who came before him were determined, and some even were Muslim, Moorish Americans, same thing. The Moorish Americans preceded the nation of Islam by a few years. They called, also called the Moor Science Temple. And Mr. Farad came after them and gave my father the, the name Holy Temple of Islam. Very similar language, very similar to that of the more, more American people. <clears throat> and there are many other similarities for more American movement uh, organization of those people and us, the Nation of Islam. <clears throat> anyway, getting back to the main idea, the main thought here, none of them were satisfied with our poor showing in our own life as a people. As a people, not talking about as an individual. We know we have Oprah Winfrey. We know she got plenty of money and giving away expensive cars and she's charitable and everything. We appreciate that. We know about other millionaires and perhaps even a few billionaires among us, African American people, like Oprah Winfrey, you know? We know of them but they carry more burden on their hearts and minds and souls than the poor people in these neighborhoods that go along just like birds, bees, butterflies, doing nothing but being happy to have just a little bit of life and a quick season and they're gone like the butterflies that come when the weather is nice for a while and they're gone, yes? They don't seem to carry much burden on their hearts and minds and souls. They're flighty, they're carried by the winds, they're happy, they're up and down like birds, getting up with the sun and going in at night. They're happy. They don't have any big issues, no big problems. But those who have been blessed to have experiences and opportunity to meet with people who know the nature and way of life that we call the life of America and the life of the neighborhood. And they carry a great burden on them because they know that God didn't intend for black people to be only butterflies and birds, flighty things in the air, up and down with the sun and darkness. Yeah, God didn't intend that for people. God intended that people have a plan for their lives. That they have a life plan that supports and protects their life presently and in the future. A plan for themselves now and for the generations to come. Well, if we are with the spiritual enlightened people, all of us don't have to have that awareness or the ability to manage life for ourselves. It's enough for every people, for the Polish, that they have Polish, Polish intelligent leadership in the church, in politics, in business, in culture, etc., who have the interests of their collective life and will not just work for themselves as individuals, but will work for the bigger cause even more than they work for themselves individually, work for the biggest cause, bigger cause of managing and securing the management of the life of themselves as a whole, the collective whole. We once had that. This ain't nothing strange to us. When we 
sought to change our situation from that of a people in bondage or enslaved on the plantations of the South to that of a free people along with all other American citizens Frederick Douglass and those who were working before him that perhaps we don't know by name. Frederick Douglass, of course, is plainly established in history. And the Quakers, the abolitionists that he worked with or who accepted him to be an able spokesman for the abolitionist movement and those who came after him, all the way down to Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King, or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam, and the Civil Rights Movement. Yes, all the way down there. We had leadership. Benjamin Mays, Benjamin Mays is gone now. But Benjamin Mays was a man that I got to know. I used to read his column in the newspaper. And uh, I got to know him personally before he passed. A Christian man, Christian educated man, and educated him too himself. Wonderful man that never forgot that his people need help and need leadership, need guidance need someone to keep the important issues before them. He didn't forget that. And there were many others in politics and religion, in politics, and some even in business, and especially in education, beginning with Carter G. Woodson, who felt that freeing people or taking this, permitting the slaves to leave the plantation and to leave their former masters or owners was not enough. That we would still be slaves if someone didn't take the chains off our minds. The chains of slavery. Ideas that we accepted that was imposed upon us by white supremacy about a world that favored whites getting up and blacks staying down. The chains of ideas that put us down as people of value, as a human being having equal human worth with other human beings, originally, if not in the circumstances we were in. Believing in what the founding fathers believed in for all human beings belonging to the citizenry of the United States, believing that every human being begins with the same qualifications for life and progress when they come from their mother's wombs. Muhammad the prophet said, every child is born submitting his will to the will of God. Until the circumstances the children are put in change that. So if a child is put in circumstances where he looks at, and get the, at his mother and he gets to know his mother as a slave, as property owned by another human being with a different face, a different nationality, a different race, pardon me, the circumstances for that child are greatly inferior in terms of this power to lift the child up to where God wants it to be, to the circumstances for the child who's born in the favor favorite situation or the favorite situation of being a child of the one who owned the, the master, uh, pardon me, the African-American woman and her child. So these are realities that we can't forget, that we didn't start off equal equally. We were born equally, but we didn't start off equally. We lost our record, our history, our lifeline in Africa, and we had to start a lifeline in the circumstances 
that the world put us in, the white world put us in, circumstances of slavery, the circumstances of blacks being called subhuman, not equal to whites, etc. Those are the circumstances, and we have to remember those circumstances and look at what's happening now to us as a people and tie what's happening now to what happened back then. If you started off in good sacred circumstances, you will be in good circumstances now. But if your beginning was in bad circumstances and you haven't fully recovered from those bad circumstances, then you could be in a bad situation now when we look at the situation for people who didn't suffer those bad circumstances that we suffered as a people. Is this making sense to you? It makes perfect, perfect sense to me. And what bothers me, what troubles my heart, is that we don't have enough of our leaders on this case. We got to get on the case. They have to be here where we are right now in this conversation or in this speech that I'm making to you. We have to be right here. There's a reason why we can't establish our neighborhoods. There's a reason why we don't have the spirit to change our neighborhood so that it be a credit to us and not a shame on us. It's a shame on us now that we live in our living quarters. Understand this. Your neighborhood is your living quarters. We live in our living quarters and we don't have our own stores. We don't have our own real estate offices. We don't have our own insurance offices. We don't have our own management of our neighborhood. We don't decide the climate, speaking morally, speaking financially. We don't decide the climate of our own neighborhoods. It's others who look at our neighborhood and say, well, here's nothing but space for business. They don't occupy any space in their neighborhood. So there ain't nothing but open spaces here for others who want to do business in the black neighborhoods. So let us go to the black quarters and let us set up our business. And when they have their needs, they come out of their homes and they come to us. That's a disgrace on any people. That they can't have enough awakeness of mind or enough conscience of mind to realize that as long as their living quarters is provided for and dictated by other than themselves, they will never be any more than a baby people. Now, baby people, Long Elijah Muhammad says we're a baby nation. That's how his teacher told him to look at us. Baby nation. Why baby? Because you haven't got what little boys got. in other people's quarters. Huh? That has to change. And we're about changing that. But equally important to us now, in fact, if we miss the, the, the second importance that I'm getting ready to explain to you right now, we'll never be able to take care of the first. And the second is this, that no people a, a separate to themselves are considered alone are of more importance than the human family. The human family includes all races. The human family includes all ethnic groups, all colors, black, white, red, brown, whatever you want to call it, yellow, Asians, all. That's the human family. And when God gives us human beings. He doesn't give us human beings that's members of the black race. 
are members of the white race or the yellow race or the red race or whatever color we want to give the races. He doesn't give us members of those races. They become members of our race after we raise them and teach them what was put into us. If you take a baby as soon as it's born from an African-American family and you put it in a Chinese family, that baby will come up a Chinese. Likewise, if you put the Chinese baby as soon as it's born from his mother into an African-American family or house, that baby will come up an African-American. Oh no, it'll still be a Japanese. It's, everybody will see us a Japanese. You're talking about physical picture. That's not the real life. The real life is how that child thinks. The real life is how that child feels. All right? That child will be raised thinking and feeling like an African American if it's taken from the Chinese mother and put in the African American house. And the only way it'll be able to connect with the thinking of a Chinese or a Japanese people, it will have to get up and be educated Educated. Don't laugh. This is more important than what you discovered or what you noticed. Don't laugh. Be serious. If you laugh, they tell me you're stupid. They tell me you're silly-minded. And you can't get this, what I'm offering you, if you're silly-minded. <clears throat> Don't look for faults in people. Look for beauty and guidance and excellence and light and intelligence. Then you'll get it. Okay. We're going to get on that, too later what dispositions us to be that way yeah all right excuse me I love my people if I see a problem I'm gonna try to help them right on the spot I love all people my people are human beings but my closest relatives are black <laughs> and that's what got me all tied up <laughs> ah, praise be to Allah. Now, so the first identity is human. First identity is human. Allah didn't make us Japanese, Spanish, whatever. Allah made us human. God made all of us human. And we belong to the family that he made firstly and lastly. The family that he made is the human family. But because of our circumstances on this earth, <clears throat> we separated from each other. We developed our own languages. Certain regions of the earth gave us our color. I'm talking my skin pigmentation now. But no matter what physical picture you come into, <clears throat> it does not necessarily have to decide the way you think, the way you feel. So what are you more important? A piece of flesh or a mind and a soul? Huh? Where is your real identity? In your piece of flesh that you have? That body? That flesh body? Or is your real identity in the way you think, the way you feel? Your mind and your soul. It's in your mind and your soul. That's where your real identity is. Firstly, in your soul, the soul that God's create, human soul that he creates. So in our religion, and it's the same for Christianity and Judaism, and I believe other religions too. I've studied religion, a lot of, lot of religion. I've done a lot of study of religion. I believe I know Judaism like, like Jewish scholar know Judaism. I believe I know Christianity like Christian scholar know, know Christian, knows Christianity. Yes, so anyway, <clears throat> God says... That he gave us our pictures when we were in the body of our mothers, when our mothers were carrying us, before we were born after nine months or whatever, come early maybe, some of us. So before we were born, God says he gave us our pictures in the bodies of our mothers, when we were being formed in the bodies of our mothers. And God says of those pictures, he said, and he made them beautiful. Beautiful. He made them beautiful. Then God says that he gave us 
our single picture, <clears throat> one picture, not different pictures. So he gave us our many pictures. That means God is the one who made this earth to bear us in our different colors and features. But the same God made us <clears throat> one picture, one human type, one human type, one picture. That's our human identity. And God says of that one, he made it the best. And he made the best picture for you, your single picture, your picture as a human being. Therefore, whoever loses his human life and his interest in himself as a human person loses his best picture. An African American but that lost his human interest in himself as a human person, he lost a great value. And whatever he puts upon himself will eventually fail him. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he mentioned the term dress, D-R-E-S-S, -S, dress. And I've heard him tell us, that is tell the congregation, the body, and I've heard him tell also educated persons who are questioning him. This, he said, well, my job is mainly to dress our people up. He say, I, I have to put them in a new dress. That's what he said. One of the people, educated people, young man, who was doing his thesis or dissertation for his PhD degree, he was from Africa, named Asian Iasian Udum. He wrote a book on the followers of Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Very important book, I thought. He said that he understood the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's main work to be Guiding his people to a cultural life. A cultural life. Now, Elijah Muhammad would put it in this sense. He would say, dress them up. I'm trying to dress them up. So actually, men of great insight, especially, I should say men and women, of great insight, especially in religious knowledge, they understand <clears throat> even our flesh on our bones to be a dress, to be a clothing. That's not the real self. The real self is what's under the clothing. Our feelings, our thinking, that the clothing in case. Yes, our mind and our feelings that the flesh encases. So they see the, the flesh itself as a clothing. That's the understanding they get when they study God's words to his prophets and messengers on how he formed or how God formed human life, that the real life is the inner body, not the flesh body that houses the inner body, that's spiritual. Not spiritual in the sense of Negro spirituals or black spirituals, spiritual in the sense that it is the life that is intelligent, that is moral, and that is aspiring. 
always wanting to be better and aspiring life, aspiring for a greater situation, for a better situation, for better, bigger and better opportunities, etc. So it's the life in that's the more valuable life, and that's the life that's truer to the identity of the, of the, of the life form that we call human life, that we call human life. This is very important, especially for people who lost or are missing a continuous lifeline that came from people of identity with land, Africans with African land, Igbo with Igbo land, Hausa with Hausa land, huh? African people, African families, African tribes who identify with their land and have a history that, can, that they can read and reconnect if they go to Mexico or to New York as a child and lose that knowledge. They can get their books on their people and get that knowledge right back and get back in step with their lifeline. But we can't get back in step with our lifeline because it's been so completely severed and lost there's no possible way to get it back. And we have Got, gotten now a new lifeline and it has become so valuable in our soul <laughs> that really the soul won't even let us try to connect again with a life that's before this one. You hear me? Yes. Bad circumstances sometimes produce wonderful things. Precious things. And a comparison is made of a blacksmith who heats the metals, burn the metals, make them lose their shape and form, and they become formless or shapeless. They become liquid, taking the shape of whatever is holding them or the container that the liquid is in. They lose their shape and have to take the shape of whatever is holding them. But the blacksmith is not through there. He just reduced it down to zero. Huh? So he can begin working on it again. He's going to make something better than it was before. So eventually he makes a beautiful ornament. Or he makes a beautiful weapon. Out of something that you would just pass by and kick aside on the road. Huh? Or say, hey, that's worthless. But he picked it up and he melted it down. Took it out of form, its form that it was in. So it could be put into another form. But that's exactly what slavery had done to our soul. It melted, it burned, and tortured our soul until it melted all the precious elements in our souls. Melted them all. But in melting it, it brought the dross up to the top. The impurities came up to the top. That stuff put on us by the white supremacy all floated to the top. And, and when we stood up in our new form, in our new body, that stuff just peeled off and cracked up and fell to the ground. And here we are, a shining new metal. A shining new metal. Yes. With Frederick Douglass in our thinking. Huh? With W.E.B. Du, du Bois in our thinking. Yes. With Booker T. Washington in our thinking. Carter G. Woodson in our thinking. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad in our thinking. Yes. Big ideas in our thinking. And we look back and say, oh, God, were you the one preparing me to be this new creature? Did you just use that stupid white man to melt me down so I could get back up like this? Thank you, God. The angel whispered from heaven, you black folks, would you like to go back to Africa? Hell no! <laughs> hell no! <laughs> what we've discovered here, hell no! We don't want to go back. <laughs> Do you realize that once, once you were so anxious to stay there, you jumped off the ship that they had you on, and you drowned yourselves in the water? Thousands upon thousands of you jumped overboard and killed yourselves? You, you're telling me you don't want to go there now? <laughs> hell no! 
I'm happy right here in the United States of America. <laughs> Where my life started again in a fiery furnace of plantation slavery. And God was overseeing my burning. And he lifted me up, cooled me off, precious shining metal. Yes. Allahu Akbar. So what is that to tell you? That when people go to the extreme of erasing, removing from the soul's awareness, its form and picture that God wanted for it, God intervenes. God intervenes. And another thing, when people lie in the name of God, and make people believe that what they're saying actually came from God. God, in time, intervenes. And God will bring the victims of the lie to know the truth. Yes? And God will be their friend and comforter. Oh, yes. That's what has happened to those black leaders, or African-American leaders, who have been sincere and true to themselves, to their God, and to their people. God has made his presence known to them, and they knew that we would survive till the time come when we could get ourselves situated to not only survive, but to prosper with everybody else in this America. They knew it, and you need to be told that again and our leaders need to become aware of that again. They are nothing but little children, lost from their adult parents who taught us the right way, the right way, and situated us for a good future. They need to be connected again with their parents so they can stop being children trying to lead children. And the time is here, and more and more I'm seeing signs of new leaders coming on the scene. New leaders are coming on the scene. Now, freedom we have. But if we don't have the right mind, this freedom can be very harmful. Freedom is only good for people in their right senses. A person not situated right in their own mind will not know what freedom really is for. Freedom for conscious people is not the freedom to do anything good or bad. Freedom for conscious people is the freedom to do things to better your life now and for the future. It's harmful to tell people they're free and knowing that they don't have the sense to understand what you're talking about. Knowing that they'll say, oh, free? That means I do what I please. God says he has not made any human being and left that human being alone to do as it pleases. God says that. He says he has put over every human person a watcher to watch us, to record our behavior, and to credit us with our good actions and to write down our bad actions so that our bad actions eventually punish us. Yes. That he'll put over us a writer to record angels. You may not believe in angels. I do. Put over us angels to record what we're doing. To watch over us. To even support us against the things that are too big and too difficult <clears throat> for us to manage. When we are being right, or when we are innocent, maybe being wrong but innocent, 
He gave us these angels as guardians over us. Say, no soul is left alone. No soul is without a guardian watching over it. Believe these things, even if you can't understand them fully with your minds. You know, if, if an ignorant person had nothing to help it but what his mind could understand, it sure wouldn't have a chance. Not even in this little, the little town that I live in called Markham. Wouldn't have a chance. It's only because there are people who care and a society that wants its citizens educated, et cetera, and protected, their rights protected, that such a poor soul have a chance to live and prosper in the world with other people. So never think that a small mind of an average person is the protection for, you, for that person or for that person's family or for that person's friends and not to even mention the neighborhood or the society that we live in or are part of. No. We have to get away from this idea that, oh, it's me. The big eye is me. I'm the big eye. And I don't have to accept anybody or anything if I don't want to. That's the idea that Satan promotes. That's the thinking that Satan promotes so he can take advantage of the many. All that he convert to that thinking, he know that he can take advantage of them. He know that they belong to him. To fare well now in this freedom that we have, this world of freedom, that's what it is. America offers the greatest margin or the greatest amount of freedom to its citizens. But at the same time, America provides for intellectuals, high schools of higher learning, freedom of thought, freedom of mind, freedom of expression, So that the best human qualifications can be seen and people can have a choice whether they go to the way of the ignorant or the way of the unlearned who don't respect anybody's thinking or anybody's mind or whether they choose an intellectual and listen to that intellectual or choose a fine institution of learning and go there and be educated. We have these choices. These choices that our special freedom give us in America, freedom gives us in America. So we do have choices. And no matter how much we criticize the conditions in our life, our neighborhood, in our homes, and how much we want to blame it on the establishment, the system. The fact is, we do have choices. You are not badly situated in America because there is no way out for you. You are badly situated because you won't make free choices. Or if you make choices, you make the wrong choices, you choose to do nothing with your life. But let other influences manage your life for you. Song and dance. Violence and sex. Freaking off. All your life until you're dead. Those are your choices. So we can't blame, we can't even blame Satan. <laughs> no, we are told in scripture that when Satan is blamed for what people have done, people did to go to, to make them go to hell, to bring them to hell, Satan going to look at God and he's going to say, I didn't do that to them. <laughs> they did that to themselves. 
I never force anybody to do anything. I only invite them and they come. That's what he's going to say. Yeah, I, I threw a party and I invited them. I didn't force them to come. They flooded the door. They piled up at the door. I couldn't even open the door fast enough for them, God. It ain't my fault. That's in them. But God knows the devil set, he set the thing up, you know. He set the thing up. So he, he determined your behavior. Satan, without light and guidance from God, determined your behavior. So God ain't going to excuse him. God going to say to hell, you and them both. Now, you didn't know that, did you? You didn't know the devil can be put in hell. You didn't know that, did you? Our religion tells us that in the end of the world, when God concludes the matters, he's going to put Satan in the hellfire with all the sinners that deserve to go to hellfire. And you'd be surprised. The majority of sinners don't deserve to go to hellfire. The majority of sinners deserve to be excused because they didn't do it because they wanted or because they had that desire in them or because they had an uh, interest in it. They were victims of circumstances. And when, and when the light comes on, they make a different choice. So they won't be, they won't go to hell. Don't think that hell, everybody going to hell. I hear people say, oh, self-righteous people. You know, they think that's because they married and never touched a girl before they married. That everybody that did going to hell. No, no, it's something much worse to touch, touch than a girl that'll get you to hell quicker. <laughs> to fare well, we have to be situated well. And guidance come to us, whether it's in the form of education or in the form of religious language or teachings. Guidance come to us to help us better situate ourselves. And the best guidance is the guidance that God revealed to his servants, the prophets and the messengers. That's the best guidance for situating us. But we get help from education. Education can situate us for success in life so that we survive and prosper. But if we ignore it and don't give it any respect, we, 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 we take our own self out of the race and we eliminate our own selves from the good life that God wants for all of us. <clears throat> the spiritual prescription is concerned with three modes of life. And it's true for all of these great religions. Although in our, our holy book it gives us this way. It says that there's a natural tendency in, in man's soul and in his life, whole life, to behave impetuously. That is to behave without thinking. On impulse, to act on impulse, to act on a feeling. You feel something, just quickly act. Something gets your, get your, get your attention, you quickly respond to it without questioning it, without examining it. This is the first mode of, the, of life in the soul of people. That's the first mode. Now, it's just a coincidence that I have on loafers today. I doubt if any of you all seen me in loafers before. I wear them sometimes. They're called loafers. And they got a little space, a little place there for a penny. And we used to call them penny loafers. And some people would say, I criticized another person, or oh, I could buy him for two cents. Well, I'm wearing loafers today, you know. Only thing I'm missing is two shiny pennies. I wish I had them. <laughs> two shiny pennies to put in my loafers. <clears throat> Well, that represents they go on, it's loafers go on your feet. So that represents that first level in the human soul, where the human soul forms in that mode where it just reacts 
without giving hardly any thinking, just react. And that's the mode that the baby's in. Average baby's in that mode, right? They're in that mode. They're in the mode that says, this is good, this is bad. This is hot, this is cold. This hurts, this feels good. I like you, I hate you. Right? This is the baby mode. Now, would you believe that some of you all are 68 years old and still in that mode? And you with me just because I do something that you like. Right. Oh, oh, I like the way he cracked those jokes. He got humor. I'm going to see my leader today. Right. Oh, he's a son of Elijah Muhammad. I love this father. His father's gone, but I'm going to stay with the son. That's not enough, my friend. You should see my mind. You should see my thinking. You should see where I'm going with my thinking. And you will love me more. And you will value me higher. And you will become men and women instead of little babies in the mold <laughs> of an infant. But that mold is good, so the Quran says. Allah says that mold is good. No matter how grown we get, we're going to have to, at some times in our life, resort to that mode. God puts some questions before us sometimes. God puts some matters before us to concern ourselves with sometimes. And they are matters that we can't fully understand. But if God says to, a, to an obedient soul, this is what I have prepared, prepared for you, that soul will never say, I can't handle that. That soul accepts it. And sometimes it's our baby mode that have to save us from our adult mode. Because the adult mode say, oh, I ain't accepting nothing my mind can't handle. But the soul will resort to that baby mode, the infant mode. And the infant mode will say, whatever God says, is, 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 I have to accept and I'm going to obey it. Won't use this rationale. Won't use this reason, reasoning mind. But we'll just say, on faith, God wants it for me, I accept it. Say, and a little child shall lead them. Huh? If the leaders are adult leaders with all of their rational powers, all of their education and rational powers, if they don't have also in their makeup that infant that makes sense to them and the mind won't, they cannot lead us very long and cannot lead us very far. And a child shall lead them. Praise be to Allah. But there's another mode, a higher mode as we get older and as we experience more with our thinking, with our curiosities and our hearts. It is the mode called Lawama. Nefsa Lawama. This is the critical mode where man is not just accepting everything or anything and saying good or bad, hot or cold, hurt, hurt, hurtful or, 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 or pleasant. No, man wants to know why it's hurtful, why it's pleasant, why it's good, why it's bad. He wants logic to support what he accepts into his mind that God created to be also a logical uh, 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 a a logic-seeking apparatus, a logic-seeking machinery, huh? So he wants to understand these things, not just accept it, good, bad, hot, cold, like that. So that's Nephtalowama. And this mode brings him to become critical of his own family life. I'm speaking of us in the big family now. Become critical of the human family. This mode can bring him to become critical of the human family. It can bring him to estimate human value very cheaply. His intelligence, his sciences, whatever he discovered with his intellect, make him feel so much above the self he was before that he judged all common people as being inferior 
and not qualified to manage their own lives. That is what brought the world into monarchies that, that persecuted the majority of the people. Dictatorships, kingships, and etc. that persecuted and, 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 and held down the majority of the people. Kept women down, kept females down, kept uh, 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 the race that they thought was not, or the people they thought was not in their level, or on their level of enlightenment, kept them down too and denied them freedom to, to qualify for the higher levels of society. This is history. This is the history of human societies all over this planet Earth. Don't think just in one area. On every continent, there was that, that kind of intellectual arrogance that kept the masses of people in slavery, virtual slavery. Not always under chain of physical things holding them, but denied them opportunities to be equally educated. Denied them the opportunity to equally progress in society, equal opportunities in society. They denied them that. They wrote them off as being not qualified because they were not members of the elite. They were not members of the intellectual high, high, high rulers managing the world for, for them. They were not qualified for that, they, they, they said. They said by nature they are not qualified. That we who have this, we have this nature that they don't have. And they confuse their perception. And they thought that what they were perceiving as being their nature was really divine. And that they were godly. They were like angels and gods. And the common people were like animals. The common people are in our form as, as we appear to their physical eyes. But they are not in our true form. Their form is the form of the animals. And our forms are the forms of angels and gods. Huh? This is history I'm sharing with you now. Or helping you to review if you know it already. This is history. This was the majority of the world. Yes. I guess that's why Allah says, God says in our holy book, The great majority of people, they don't understand. They don't have enough knowledge. Well, look. Right now, you are in touch with what I'm saying to you with your ears, with your eyes, with the thinking that's going on in your mind. And all of that is happening in the heaven of your body. Heaven means highly elevated. I'm not talking about <laughs> heaven as you understood in the church or somewhere. <laughs> heaven means highly elevated. So what, what, I, what, your, your, what, you, what you are staying in touch with me with is something that's in the heaven of your statue, your structure, your anatomy, your head. Now, if we could put your head on a scale and weigh it, then put the rest of the body on the scale and weigh it. Your head in comparison with your body is small in weight, right? So it's the small that's overseeing the big, isn't it? Well, when you get leadership more than the body, whoo, you're in bad shape. You are in bad shape. You would think that if an animal has more ears, it's supposed to hear better. That donkey is, a, is the baddest hearing, the worst hearing creature God made, I think, is that donkey. And look how big his ears are. Big old ears. But you can't get it to hear anything. It just keeps straining to hear. Uh, get bigger and bigger, trying to hear. Can't hear anything. <laughs> Little mouse got little tiny ears. Hear so well. 